some thank yous straight away. Thanks to Stephen and his colleagues at the Foreign Policy Centre who have been very supportive to the project from the beginning. And thanks also to the John Smith Memorial Trust and to the other organisations, Engage, Progress, Labour Friends of Iraq, the Henry Jackson Society uh, and colleagues of Democratia. The, the journal was launched in late 2005. It's a journal which is a book review um, and it's mainly dedicated to mapping out what a progressive democratic foreign policy looks like in the world we've inherited after the end of the Cold War and after 9-11. Um, so I'll speak for about 10 minutes tonight and set out some of the main themes that I think come out from the book. Um, first of all, this is the first time I've spoken in the House of Lords. Very impressive. Um, when Benjamin Disraeli, the former Conservative Prime Minister, was welcomed into the House of Lords in 1876, he took a look around apparently and said, I am dead. <laughs> uh, dead but in the Elysian fields. Uh, as you may know from Homer's Odyssey, the Elysian plain is a blessed and happy land at the world's end where a select few favoured by the gods come to a kind of paradise. Um, mind you, not even the promise of paradise has been enough to attract some people here. The Labour intellectual Richard Tawney was offered a peerage by Ramsay MacDonald in 1933. And Tawney wrote back indignantly to MacDonald, thank you for your letter, but I ask you, what harm have I ever done the Labour Party? <laughs> <laughs> and um, as I turn to my notes, I'm reminded of that uh, poor unfortunate peer mentioned in Lord Holmes' memoirs, who began a speech one day by reading from a briefing note his assistant had prepared for him. Fortunately, it wasn't the correct briefing note, and with great confidence, he informed his lordships that this is a rotten argument, but it should be good enough for their lordships on a hot summer. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope my remarks will be good enough for an audience as knowledgeable as this one. I'd like to step back from the day-to-day -day headlines and highlight six big ideas which emerged from these conversations, ten conversations in the book. Each idea might help us think about the broad direction of travel of democratic foreign policy. They should open a debate Anyway, first of all, though, each of the ideas is a response to what we might call the new terrain of foreign policy. It's a terrain that's mapped in the book by Anne-Marie Slaughter, Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton and convener of the Princeton Project, which was a three-year bipartisan effort to develop a national security strategy for the USA. Anne-Marie told me that when the group began, they wanted to develop a new X article. Now, for those who don't know what the X article was, it was a, a famous long telegram sent by George Kennan who was then the head of the US Embassy in Moscow in 1946, back to his bosses in Washington. And in it, Kennan made the case for the strategy of containment as the cornerstone of the West's response to communist totalitarianism. It was probably the most important State Department cable ever written. Now, the point is this. In 2006, Anne-Marie and her colleagues never did write that contemporary version of the X article. But why not? She takes up the story in the book, and I quote, we realized that looking for an equivalent to containment presumed one overarching threat. But we are in a world of multiple threats, and at least five of them, terrorism, nuclear proliferation, pandemics, climate change, the implosion of the Middle East, are equal in gravity. And there are two major challenges, the rise of India and China, and the challenge of managing globalization. So she concluded, you have to have a strategy that can respond in multiple directions once, there was no contemporary version of containment. On that terrain, then, what signposts should Democrats follow? I, I offer these six. The first signpost, from simplicity to complexity. Again and again, I heard the experts reject the simplicities of the old foreign policy paradigms. They rejected the simplicity of the so-called realist paradigm of the old Kissingerian right. Whatever's gone wrong in Iraq, I think Condoleezza Rice was correct when she said, for 60 years we often thought that we could achieve stability without liberty in the Middle East, and ultimately we got neither. Now we must recognize, as we do in every other region of the world, that liberty and democracy are the only guarantees of true stability and lasting security. But they also rejected that new simplicity that can tend to think democracy promotion is exhausted by having a good heart, overturning the dictator, and holding elections in the rubble. Martin Shaw, when I interviewed him, rejected the simplicity of the old anti-imperialist <coughs> paradigm, which today often reduces world politics to a cosmic struggle between the resistance 
and the empire until its adherents are left marching down London streets, waving placards proclaiming, we're all Hezbollah now. More about that left shortly. Jean Beth Gielstein challenged the, the simplicities of the old liberal internationalist paradigm, which may be more challenging for many of us. Um, she argued that to breezily see the UN as currently constituted as the font of legitimacy and as the mechanism for solving all problems is problematic. And Anne-Marie Slaughter spelled out why it really won't do. She said, liberal internationalism can become a dogma that everything has to be done through international institutions without paying attention to the types of government who are in those institutions, autocracies, oligarchies, theocracies, as well as democracies. And they'll treat a genocidal dictatorship the same way they'll treat a liberal democracy. So that's the, the first signposters, I think, is being willing to at least be skeptical towards the old signposts. I think that might well be the beginning of, of wisdom. The second signpost relates to the kind of fight we're in. Um, and the signpost reads, from old wars to new wars. And this is an expression of Mary Calder's. Mary said, we don't face old wars anymore, we face new wars. What did she mean? She said, an old war was a war between states. The war was fought by opposing uniformed armed forces, and the decisive encounters were battles between those forces. Soldiers were clearly distinct from civilians. She said, a new war is fought by combinations of state and non-state actors. It's usually fought for identity. Battle is rare, and most violence is directed against civilians. Mary argued in the interview that the mistake of Donald Rumsfeld was that his revolution in military affairs tried to assimilate the, the new information technology of warfare to a very old concept of the social relations of warfare. Do so you think that knocking the Iraqi army over, it will mark the end of the war? And she argues that's not how new wars work. New wars end with the entrenching of human security, with political legitimacy, political reconciliation and development. They are long hauls. And therefore, they demand the resources of the international community and the kind of legitimacy that will ensure popular backing at home over the long term. New wars are also what Martin Shaw in the book calls global surveillance wars. What, did, what do you mean by that term? Warfare, he said, is now much more constrained by surveillance. What he meant is national and international political surveillance, legal surveillance, surveillance exercised through elections and public opinion, and also through the mass media. The result? Warfare is now conditioned by, rather than dominating, politics, economics, and the media. The result of that, the home front, can determine the outcome of new wars. So if we take Afghanistan, we do have an in-country coalition leadership that wants to transition to what some people call fourth-generation warfare. Coordinating counterinsurgency efforts along the twin axes of security and development. But is there really the physical or the human resources in theatre to do that? Is there the political will in the international community to provide them? Probably not at the moment. And this lack of capacity reflects a deep ambivalence uh, about the effort back at home, especially in Europe. And that ambivalence directs us to what are my third and fourth signposts.